Uh, thanks for showing up. I'm uh, JP, and I'm here to tell you to talk about how easy it is to build your own Trojan hardware at home, even if you're not a hardware techie person. Uh, I'd like to thank Black Hat Asia for uh, letting me speak this year. Uh, this guy here, uh, I am a computer security consultant at Foundstone. I do mostly pen testing of all kinds. I like to think of myself as a breaker of things. I'm not nearly as good at fixing things as I am breaking them. Uh, my personal interest areas are like wireless security, um, portable, and by portable I mean like little gadgets and things, not necessarily like wi mobile security, not phones and stuff. Um, hardware, which is uh, a newer venture for me. Um, uh, I've learned all this in the past few years. I, I came up as a software guy, so just trying to come from the perspective of people here that are not hardware engineers. Uh, I didn't come from that side either, but I've been learning it. Uh, and also physical security. Uh, a couple of the projects that, that I've worked on uh, are Katana, which is a multi-boot uh, USB flash drive. Um, BRNG is like a wireless hacking toolkit. It's a bunch of Bluetooth hacking stuff um, and some hardware I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and I've spoken at several other cons before, uh, exclusively in the US, so I'm super excited to be here in Singapore speaking at Black Hat Asia. So the goals of this talk, uh, I want to discuss uh, building Trojan hardware at home. And we're very used to hearing the concept of a Trojan, but going back you know, many, many decades, that's always been a software side of things. You always think of downloading a file, clicking on it, and all of a sudden you're infected with you know, something, uh, some sort of buzzword item. Uh, big focus here is you do not need to be, uh, I keep emphasizing this fact, and I'll probably say it again, you don't need to be you know, super hardware hacker person to perform these types of attacks. Um, you'll see sort of how easy it is. Uh, we'll get a little bit technical, but I'm going to try to stay a little bit on a, a broader scope. Um, I'm going to try to remain as platform neutral as possible. I'm not targeting any specific vendor here as much as we'll be discussing types of devices. Uh, obviously, I'm using a you know, vendor item. Kind of ignore that. That's, that's totally useless. That is not the information you need to take away from this. This is vendor neutral uh, sort of a discussion. And I want to show you how easy it is to perform these hardware uh, attacks against you know, common everyday things you find in the home, in the office, on the market. Um, just stuff you see, tons of stuff you see in this room. So let's simplify hardware. How many people here uh, mess with hardware either as a hobby or professionally? Okay, I see about half a dozen hands. And that's what I really um, found in the security field in general, where a lot of software people we either came from uh, programming, IT, some sort of administration, and then moved into security. Uh, and there's almost no people that have done hardware and moved into security from there. A lot of people that have gotten into it, like I have, it's always been sort of a, a curiosity hobby thing. Um, there's a, a few people out there that came from hardware that are doing security. But as a field, uh, it seems like the hardware side of thing really gets overlooked. So just going to make it you know, a little simple for you. Um, we break it down so, so the hardware doesn't seem so mysterious. So what do we normally have? We have a PCB board, a printed circuit board. Um, you've got your tiny single-use components like a resistor, an LED, the crystal clock, capacitors. Um, you've got some specialized chips like your RAM, um, maybe a controller like an Ethernet controller or a USB controller that all it does is interpret data from one side to USB and back, so it doesn't do lots of things. You've got your primary processor, which is kind of you know, the mothership, controls everything. You've got your input-output ports, and these are sometimes on the board themselves, you know, inside, and sometimes it's like your USB, Ethernet, VGA, audio, all of those are, you know, information out, information in sort of ports. And we also have firmware, and this isn't necessarily strictly physically hardware, but almost everything, all the devices we use nowadays, nothing's uh, written, like flashed on hardware side. A lot of it is controlled by firmware. So we're going to encapsulate firmware as hardware today. So we're talking a little bit about the firmware side uh, as well. So modifying hardware. What do we need to like, look at in order to get started? We want to see what's in the box. Uh, I've become obsessed with taking apart everything I buy now. Um, which is not good because I'm very bad at putting it back together. I get really curious and I open up and I look up all the parts and stuff and then it kind of just sits there and I'm like, oh, that's my TV. I should put my TV back together. I kid you not, my TV right now is disassembled at home. Um, 
So it's not very that difficult either. It's a, it's sometimes that's a good thing to demystify hardware. If you're not used to seeing a PCB board, you open it up and it's like all these you know, lines going everywhere, all these parts, and it looks very mysterious. But then if you kind of break it down into its actual components you care about, there's like four points on there of the main chips. You don't care about a lot of the other stuff. Um, so that helps demystify. So you open up the box, see what's in it. Even from the outside, you know, you don't have to open up. You can see there's USB connectors. Um, you might have a PS2 connector, RJ45 Ethernet adapter. Uh, on the board, you might have things. And if you're not hardware, you might not be familiar with these sorts of uh, uh, I.O. Um, protocols. But UART, I2C, uh, SPI, these are ones that are used at a much lower level than uh, the users generally interact with. Uh, sometimes inner chip communication occurs over these sort of standardized channels. Uh, what I suggest is if you want to play around with this, get stuff cheap. Don't, don't buy things. Uh, beg friends for them, as I do constantly. Uh, find them at thrift stores or used. Or you know, A keyboard with, with five missing keys is excellent for, for practice. Um, and then you can see that the hardware inside, if you want to get the new version, for an actual test. You know, I, I definitely recommend going cheap. Uh, eBay, Craigslist, Taobao, wherever. Um, what's the purpose of the hardware? If it's a thermostat, I don't really know if I care that I can attack it. Like, what did, that doesn't really gain me anything. So maybe look at the purpose of the hardware to see what sort of vector you could possibly use uh, and how it interacts with the target. Is it, is it wireless? Is it wired? What sort of you know, USB, Ethernet? What is it going over? And you know, leverage your attacks that way. So what do you need to play along? Um, I'm a Linux guy. I, I, big promoter of Linux. Love Linux. Uh, but sometimes you just have to have Windows for um, certain development tools, or if you're testing these sorts of attacks against systems, it's good to have a development system. And in that same sense, you should probably, if you're testing an attack that's universal, have you know, all the major OSs up there. Uh, again, cheap target hardware. Why spend the money? A lot of the programmers to flash new firmware are really cheap. It's not something you have to be a corporate you know, giant to afford a development team to get these things. Software is free or open source community. Uh, the hardware is like $40, uh, depending on where you get it from. Some time to learn it. Uh, the Trojan device you'd like to embed. And obviously, minions are very helpful when you're trying to do sort of mad science projects. All right, so number one, let's start off with USB, uh, the attack vector I'll be talking about most of today. Um, so in this scenario, let's hide our, our malicious little Trojan hardware inside of an existing common piece of hardware. Uh, and I'll be talking about stuff that you can actually see. I've, I've got some stuff sitting up over here. Uh, you can poke at it later on. Uh, many, many devices, you'd be surprised how many of them have, let's say, large open cavities. These are, these are open free spaces inside the device. Uh, you know, your phone is built as compact as possible, but your mouse it's not, because you don't want to hold a mouse that's that big. It could be that big, but you don't want to hold one that big. So a mouse has the contour of your hand, but the electronics inside are very you know, small. It's flat at the bottom. So you find, as I've been opening up everything that I own, a surprising number of places where the cavity is already open, or you can cut out some plastic that really doesn't do anything other than you know, it was plastic mold injected that way, um, to fit in other devices you attack the uh, host device that it's connected to. So I don't really care about targeting you know, whatever I'm buying. I want to attack the, the computer that, I'm, you know, that, that I would assume that the target user is plugging the device into. And I want to leave it functional. So if it's a keyboard, I want to make it be a keyboard. Because if you, you, know, you modify it, and it's malicious, and you plug it in, and it doesn't work as a keyboard, you've got about 10 seconds before the user is like, well, uh, probably not thinking it's malicious as much as uh, why did I spend you know, $10, $15 on this keyboard? It's not working. They unplug it, ship it back, or throw it away, or whatever. So we want to make it do what it was intended to do, plus uh, our little bit of fun. Uh, to this end, I uh, did a Kickstarter project, and I developed um, an open source hardware platform for these exact sort of attacks. If you're familiar, uh, Arduino, do people know what the Arduinos are? We have some people here. So it's an open source, very easy uh, user base um, for hardware stuff, not just hardware hacking, like security side. But in general, if you want to get into hardware at all, it's a great platform to use. Um, and there's a lot of different boards out there, but I wanted to develop one that was specific for the security community. So I you know, had to talk to friends and then tried to think what would be the easiest way to make it accessible to the non-hardware folk, uh, but also make it really useful for, for uh, security testing. So it's Arduino compatible. 
Um, I can incorporate a lot of other hardware that's designed for Arduino stuff, so like things like a Bluetooth adapter can be added to it very easily. Um, and I wanted to make this project as easy as possible for the non-coders and engineers. Again, trying to bring it into a larger scope. Um, so I was able, I was successfully funded uh, last year, and I'm, I'm really grateful about that. Um, so a little bit about the platform. I wanted to make it easy, so uh, most of the user land configuration is a micro SD card and text files. There's no interactive front end. You don't have to write your own source code or compile it or anything. It's all uh, SD cards and dip switches. Um, I put the dip switches on there so you can have lots of different attack scenarios. So if you're not embedding it and you're just plugging it into computers that you want to attack, you can have specific targets for Windows XP, Windows 7, Server, 8, OS X, Linux, whatever you want. Uh, have them all on you at once. Plug and play. I've got the project site at the end, so you don't need to write that down right now. What we're going to focus on with here is keystroke injection. So essentially, the, the glitch is able to emulate a keyboard. Um, this functionality also exists for other Arduino-compatible devices. Uh, so it's essentially, when it's plugged in, it says, I'm a keyboard computer, and then the computer goes, cool. And then it starts sending the data that's the same as data for, you know, you're sending packets and keystrokes um, onto the target system. So uh, you essentially make it into a keyboard. So it's going to type out stuff, even though the user is not typing things. You're playing it out as if the keyboard is typing um, certain sort of attacks that we can set up. The nice thing about this sort of scenario is it types very accurately. Uh, it types very, very quickly. I have to slow it down most of the time because it can type faster than the computers can buffer it. So there's some, some you know, playing around you have to do with actual um, timing. Uh, and there's no human required. So I can ship a, uh, the you know, attack device to somebody, tell them they've won this awesome promotional, and they plug it in, and I'm you know, 10,000 or 1,000 miles away. I don't have to be anywhere near it. Or if I'm physically in the building, I can plug it in and walk away. So that's like a five-second walk, you know, plug in, you're gone, and you don't have to be around at all for these sort of attacks to take place, which is, which is nice and handy. Uh, works against anything with a keyboard. So even if you have USB host button on your iPhone, you know, this could potentially do something against it. As long as it accepts a keyboard, generic brand keyboard, you know, these sort of attacks will, will work against the system, which is nice and handy. Uh, I wrote a, a scripting language to be interpreted for these keystrokes. So because you can't type in, like, there's no ASCII character for F3, I had to write something to, to be interpreted to say, oh, I want to type out you know, F3. Um, this is a little bit about the language. You'll see some examples, um, actually, just next. Uh, there's a lot of documentation online, so I won't talk about the language too much. But this is a simple example. Uh, for any of us uh, computer linguists out there, can anybody guess what this does? It's be, it's make me very happy if somebody can figure out what this does based on the language syntax that they've learned in the last 10 seconds. What? And then, that's right, you've got a gentleman in the front. So it runs Notepad. We're doing GUI R, which for Windows Guru is here. We'll open up the run, types in Notepad, hits Enter, pops up, says, Hello, Black Hat Asia, and then Alt F4 closes it. So I'm glad that somebody within 15 seconds is able to decipher it. That makes me feel good that my language is somewhat syntactically easy. It looks very big, right? Like, it looks like you have to write a lot for it. Uh, I have a generator that you can point and click your way through all of this. Other than typing out the word notepad, you can point and click your way so you don't have to memorize all this and get it exactly correct. There's a generator for you makes things a lot easier. OK, so moving on from our Trojan side. So we've set up our Trojan device to perform attacks. And I'll talk a little bit about you know, those exact scenarios later. But say we've learned enough. We can set up our device. Now what? We want to make it into a Trojan. So let's make this super simple. We'll grab the closest mouse to us that's used in many you know, corporate areas. This was just the one that happened upon, oh, I'll just get the first one from a thrift store, of uh, USB hub and uh, the glitch. So the bottom two are completely inconsequential what brand they are. It doesn't matter. These are completely vendor neutral. They just happen to be a USB hub that's small and a mouse. Step one, crack open the mouse. Uh, you can see the different color PCBs. These are actually two different mice. Um, the reason I have it up here is most mice, uh, you flip them over, you unscrew the one screw, it pops right open. It's about a three or four second process. Uh, actually, if somebody wants to grab that mouse right there, if you want to, you guys can pass it around. Um, don't steal it, but otherwise it's okay. Yeah, see, that's okay. If it, if it, 
I don't feel bad. So we'll, we'll pass this whole thing around. Um, it's a good sized room for that sort of thing. Uh, you don't, don't, it's okay. If it's all, if it's 23 pieces when it comes back, I'll be okay. I won't be heartbroken. I uh, just wanted you guys to get some, some hands-on experience with it. You can poke at it. Um, anyway, uh, so the, generally with a mouse, there's two different options. Either, and, and most of the time it has to do with the quality, uh, either the, the USB pins are soldered to the motherboard or there's a little connector. Connectors are nice and easy for us non-solder folk. Um, and then you, so you take it out, the little scroller mouse, which I didn't give you because it falls out all the time and I'm constantly losing them. Uh, you take that out, which doesn't even, it just snaps in. And you've got this large open cavity, as you can see when you pass it around. Actually, pass it around the top of it as well. You can kind of cover it up just to see. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, uh, how much space is actually in there. Step two, awesome little USB hub. We don't need a lot of the USB hub, so what we're going to do is sever the connection from the hub to the host computer. We'll cut that, or unsolder it, actually. Uh, we, don't, we only need two USB uh, slaves, uh, the, 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 uh, the place where you actually would plug in your devices. Um, you can keep more. One of them, the attacks that I've done before, is actually I used the third one, inserted a micro SD to USB adapter, and mounted that disk to perform attacks. So I would leverage the uh, keystroke injection to mount a disk and then copy files over or you know, execute things based on that. Uh, but in this scenario, we're just using the, the single one. So we want two ports there. We'll cut off or unsolder two of them. We'll leave the other two there and cut off the very end where you'd actually plug in your, the, your device to the USB hub. This will all come together in a second. One thing that I, uh, I thought about this, I had this idea when I designed the glitch, was I want to be able to make it embedded. Has anybody, if you see, uh, when you have a, this is a micro USB connector, which you use to program and interact with the device, um, but if the adapters for micro USB to USB are really long when you're looking at this sort of scenario of wanting to embed it in a tiny device. It's almost, it makes it almost twice as long. The smallest adapter I've found is about, makes it about twice as long. So it's almost the exact length of the glitch. So you have, instead of being like two centimeters, it's like four. And that's a lot of space. So I added these solder pads on the top. So as an alternative to the USB port, you can add these four lines. Uh, so you can either solder the other ends or, or plug them in or whatever, um, so that, you know, they're just wires, so they wrap around very easy and they're much easier to embed in, in that sort of scenario. So it does take a little bit of soldering here, but it's not too terribly difficult, and I do have some, some step guides in uh, the documentation. So familiar, people that aren't familiar with USB, um, there's four wires, and thankfully those four wires are color-coded. Because a lot of times with this sort of thing, you're, you're cutting a wire, and then you have four wires. And if they're all green, you have, you have a lot of testing ahead of you. But with USB, unless it's a really, really poorly manufactured device, it almost always follows the standard, unlike me, because my white line is yellow. But that was because that's what I had, the physically closest wire that I had to me. That's my excuse. But normally, if you cut open a wire, you, you pull back the cover, you see it'd be red, white, green, and black. And they're associated with their data lines, so it makes it way easier for us to match pairs up exactly as they should go. So in this scenario, uh, we've unplugged the little connector, which is the, the USB uh, cable. Unplug it from the mouse, cut it. We're going to embed the side on the right. We're going to connect to the USB hub. The side on the left, uh, uh, the USB hub cable that's going to the computer side on the left is the USB cable going back to the, uh, the mouse. And that makes sense a lot more when I have my child drawings of it um, that I made in paint, because I'm not very good. So these are our three, three little devices, right? Step one, and then like three, four, step two, three, and four all together. Uh, we sever a lot of connections, we connect things, but you can see the original USB cable now goes to the hub. The hub is then connected to the glitch and the mouse. And then we put it all together and it fits nice and happy and inside uh, the, the, the mouse, the very common and easy to find mouse. So that makes things convenient. You now either you know, ship the mouse, replace it, swap it out. If you're using a common hardware like that, you just walk into a place and you can swap it out. Um, uh, lots of thing, promotions are good. You buy the nice big fancy mouse. And you say, hey, you, thanks for coming to Black Hat. You won this big prize. And you get it shipped to you. And you're like, sweet. And you plug it in. And then don't do that, anybody. That would be bad. <laughs> so if you get a mouse shipped to you within the next month, 
you might want to crack it open first. Uh, so that's the scenario for the mouse. Um, and that's generally you know, kind of what I'm talking about here. But I'm going to go over a few other uh, vectors just to make you think, you know, so your mind doesn't go, I should never plug in a mouse again. Your mind should go, I should never plug in anything ever any that I haven't disassembled entirely to my home or corporate network. So that's what it is altogether. Uh, I don't know how far it's gotten around, but it's not very difficult to see. I'm going to walk off camera, sorry. You've got your little tiny hub, got the glitch. Uh, I should probably shield it from touching other parts of the wire, but I haven't. Uh, and then you've got your cable sort of going out this way, and then you close it all up, and it's a mouse that scrolls and works just fine, and everything is, is great and the little light comes on the bottom, and it closes just fine. There's plenty of space in this mouse. Uh, screw it back together, and it's all good. Uh, some, some payloads. So uh, for these sort of attacks, you generally want to target a specific OS. Because if you want to open the command prompt, like I showed you before, the, uh, the uh, run dialog, it's not the same in, in Linux or Windows or uh, uh, OS X. You have to target the system a little bit. Um, and I won't go into it, but I've actually made my firmware that I wrote makes it super easy to target a specific operating system. Uh, you want it to run once, because so every time it reboots, it's not going to perform the same attack. Uh, I, have, I will be updating my firmware soon to make it do that. Uh, time delays, a lot of timing scenarios. I know a lot of this is very vague when I talk about it here. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to sh walk through an entire attack, but maybe at the end we'll see if I can show you how one is developed. Uh, and then make it look normal. If it's back in the mouse, you're shipping it out. Uh, some attack scenarios. Uh, I'll just talk about the first one. One of the first scripts I wrote, um, uh, we're good with ROT13, right? Everybody knows that Caesar Cipher, you replace a character uh, with a character that's 13 up from it, so you end up rotating the uh, ASCII, the American character set. So the, uh, the attack that I wrote is actually a batch script, because I wanted to use native resources. I don't need to download a file or anything. Uh, it pops up a text editor, types out this batch script, saves it, runs it. It rot 13, the rot 13 is all the files in my documents and then hides them. So if you're a normal user and you open up my documents, all you see are folders and every single file you have on your file system is now gone. And even if you do unhide it, they're all rot 13 and the file extensions are rot 13. So you have absolutely no way to open them. And this is all just using batch. This wasn't downloading. This was anything fancy. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the scenario was if your roommate owes you rent, uh, you plug this in, and after a couple of minutes, uh, they will pay your rent or be very sad that they've lost pretty much all their files. Because uh, manually redoing this is really not possible. Uh, but then I wrote a script, obviously, that undoes everything. You, you re 13 everything um, and unhide it. But some more practical scenarios. In Windows, you could have a TFTP server pop up, send some files back add a local user, uh, reverse SSH. Um, you can have it download files. You can actually type out binary. Like, I can copy a file by typing it out and saving it. So uh, you type it out in hex. Like this, the, the scenario is it gets typed out and then reverted back to a binary and then executed. Uh, and the glitch has that capability uh, in, in Linux, in Windows, and in OS X. So that it'll uh, type it out. It takes a long time but it'll convert it back into a binary file, execute that in any way or shape uh, you want. Or it can go to a website and download it. I mean, anything you can do with a keyboard at all, is, is you can do here. And I challenge you to try to go a day without using your mouse. You'd be surprised at how well you can get around any operating system without a mouse. There's a lot of function keys and, and you know, maybe non-common uh, scenarios where you're using Alt F3 or something, and that pops up these things. Um, but there's a lot you can do that you might not be aware of just with the Common keyboard, which is our next scenario. Keyboard, take it apart, lots more screws. Don't lose them. You always end up with like one lost screw. It doesn't matter. So every time I open it up, there's one, one more lost screw. But you can see here, uh, the, the white surface area is actually, when it, you're pressing down on the keyboard, that's what it's uh, pressing on. At the very top, you see a built-in USB hub. Super. We didn't have to buy one. Came in there. So take it apart. We remove the little keyboard thing. Um, that's a little big to pass around, but it's, it's a sheet of metal, so it's really easy to remove. Uh, and, you know, at the end, you guys can come up here and look at it. Uh, so what we're going to do this time is instead of bedding our own USB hub, we can use the, uh, the one that's already built in, which is nice and handy. Um, unfortunately, we're going to sort of disable that one. 
And my thinking is most users, you know, you generally, if you're doing a security testing, you don't target the security aware. You're not going after the IT guys directly. You're not going after the security personnel. You're going after, you know, no, not to generalize people, but like marketing and HR, business, <laughs> the, <laughs> the people that we try to govern as much as possible. Um, not, not upper management. So yeah, security people, IT, and upper upper management. This, anything the C in the front of their name, those are the, those are the off limits people. Um, so yeah, these are the people targeting. So when they plug in the keyboard and then they want to use a flash drive with the you know the USB hub in the back and they plug it in and it doesn't work, they go, oh no, you know. Then they plug it in the other one. Hey, it worked. There's not like. They don't ring you up all of a sudden and be like, whoa, hold on. Uh, I found that one USB port on the back of my new keyboard doesn't work. Um, let's, you know, let's call in the, the IR team. Not, not a really, not a high scenario. Probably not going to happen. So if one USB port is broken on the back, that's fine. The, the, the uh, keyboard itself is going to be got. good. It's still going to work just fine. Uh, and in this case, we avoid soldering it all to the, uh, the device. So, if we wanted to t do this attack in a, uh, you know, if you are physically on site and you had the screwdriver with you, uh, you can perform this attack without bringing uh, a soldering iron with you because that stands out sometimes. Uh, okay, so what we're going to do, if you see the back of this right image, you see the wires kind of coming in. So the, the, this entire segment here, this whole board, all it is is two USB ports. There's no other stuff going on there. So we know that all of these wires are for these two USB ports. Um, and there's this, you know, the same, the data wires, there's power, and there's ground. So ground can be shared amongst everything. So we don't want to solder, so we'll try to leverage that. We flip, one of the, flip the board over, and all we have to do is there's the plug, and then there's the, where the cable comes in, and there's strips of wire or the, the, that are going between the two, essentially, little bits of copper. We'll just cut it with a knife. That is not a very advanced technique. You just, anything sharp, you scrape it off. And now we've severed the connection. So anything you find around, we're going to cut that. Um, in theory, you could just cut the data. So if they plug it in, the nice fancy lights come on to their device, but it doesn't do anything. That's totally fine. Uh, but in this case, I just cut it off. So you plug it into that particular USB port, doesn't do anything. And this is the final result. Uh, what I did is I basically took the same one I had before. I had the, uh, the wires soldered onto the top of the glitch. And I shoved them into the socket. That's all it took. So the connector has, um, inside the connector, there's the wires that run. And they have little clamps. And the, so it's a, it's a wire, a clamp, and then a little plastic case, a really cheap plastic case that's very flexible. You just take the wire in, which has a little bit of exposed metal and shove it in, and it touches, it presses hard enough against the plug, what exists, that it's going to make a circuit so you can hold it together. So I didn't have to do anything other than, you know, shove it in as hard and, and hope it's not loose. It's not a very, like, advanced, stable technique, but pushing in wires and hoping they don't come loose or, you know, taping them or something like that, that's, that's what my life resorts to. I don't really go terribly advanced with things. Duct tape and WD-40 are the way to go, or in this case, probably electrical tape. Uh, and non-conductive material. So now we've got our Trojan keyboard. Uh, we put it all back together and, whoop, skipped ahead. Uh, we put it all back together and it looks exactly, again, it's the same thing. Uh, I didn't have to carve out any space. Uh, that space in there fit just right. I was able to put the keyboard back together um, and you can see it up there. Uh, it all fits very ni nice and, and easy to do. And again, any keyboard you come across with a USB hub built inside, uh, I'm making a mental list. I probably won't make like an actual list, but I do like now I go into stores in, in the U.S. like Best Buy or something, and I'm like, ooh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, why didn't you put a USB hub in there? Uh, but around here, it's a lot easier to, to find a variety of them. So we'll move on to another one. So, so far, I've taken my Trojan hardware, and I've used uh, an additional USB hub to band in the middle with it. I've used uh, an existing USB hub inside to perform my attack. In this case, I'm going to be doing uh, more of a man-in-the-middle um, attack uh, embedded in the hardware. So what I have here uh, is a very old and very dusty uh, point-of-sale card system. 
So this is the keyboard that gets plugged into the hotel or, or you know, a um, retail store or whatever. And you know, when they're taking your customer data and they scan it, and if they have to type anything in or if they have to scan anything, and this one's a little old. A lot, nowadays you have your pin pad version. Um, so this is more common sort of at, at hotels now. But uh, you've got your, your card swipe, and then you know, you've got your keyboard. And that gets plugged into the point of sale system. What I'm doing here, as you can see on the left, it, and it looks weird, that's actually the magnet used for the uh, credit card reader um, or the gift card reader or any sort of card. There's different sort of layers, but uh, there's a specific one used for normally like the financial stuff. And then it's a really old PS2 keyboard, which makes it convenient for this scenario uh, because PS2 is easier for me to um, man in the middle than uh, USB, but USB is, is also possible. Uh, so we've got those two things. Those two things are good for us. Uh, this also didn't involve any soldering at all. Actually, the glitch in here doesn't have the little wire sticking out. It's all straight up uh, plugging in things. So we saw the pinouts. You can see them better here. Again, looking up, uh, speaking, spending about you know, two minutes on Wikipedia will tell you uh, what these lines are. Unfortunately, the color coding isn't as good. So black, probably ground. Uh, the rest of it was just testing until I finally figured out what the, what, which ones uh, went back and forth. So there's four lines again. You can look it up. I'm not going to go through all the PS2 connectors. Um, so I'm going to use the same thing. This is a little bit better picture of what I was talking about before. You can see it from the top where I'm essentially going to be shoving wires directly in there where the other wires already exist. And that's what that big mesh of things at the top is. Uh, we've got the four wires that are coming from the glitch uh, to the PS2 connector. And the, the wire, the original cable for the PS2 connector, they just chopped it off. I'm not going to use that anymore. I don't care about it. Uh, the only reason that I kept those little wires sticking out there, I just cut it later. Uh, but it was easier to shove in you know, the connectors than it is to solder new ones on there. So got the connectors. It's going into the back of the glitch. The glitch reads in the keyboard. So when you're typing in stuff, it's like, oh, cool. I've got keystrokes. I can replay those. Uh, in case you don't know, most of the credit card readers just type out ASCII code. So it's not like when you swipe a card, something super secret happens. You just swipe it, and it types it out. So when it plugs into the point of sale system, uh, it, it just, oh, you, know, you click on a window, or you click on a field, and this types out the stuff that it needs. So your, the credit card name or the, the, um, the gift card name or whatever and the pertinent information all get just typed in like it's a keyboard. That's how it works. So there's, there's, there's no secondary thing going on there. So the, the keystrokes from either the keyboard or the, the card reader get sent to the glitch. The glitch then interprets it and sends it out over USB. So essentially it's like a US, PS2 to USB converter, but it's a drop. So I can record everything that's going on there. And again, you would close it up, ship it out. Uh, the reason the top isn't on this one is because it's horrible to put back together. So you would never see the inside. Uh, in this case, uh, something I might have failed to mention is while your configuration is, is from a micro SD card, uh, you can also save files to micro SD card. Uh, there's no reason not to. It has read write access. Uh, you can also mount the, the glitch as a storage device if you want to. Um, so in this case, it's, you know, if it's got a 4 gig micro SD card, you can log for years if you want to and let it sit. So this is a little bit better picture of what we've got going on. Little wires coming in from the connector, wrapping around, going to the glitch. And then we've got a USB connector. And at the very top is where the, the cable kind of pops out. So we've got that coming out. You can see the mag stripe card reader a little bit better in that scenario on the top. Uh, it doesn't really it looks you know kind of weird because the keyboard's not on it. With the keyboard on there, it looks like a standard point of sale system, even though it's like 10, 15 years old. Uh, and for fun, let's spice it up and add a Bluetooth adapter. Um, so what I did here is right now the code's just set to dump out all of the information I find over Bluetooth. So when I connect to uh, this device with my laptop or my phone or whatever, it'll just print out everything it's got going on. Um, I also I gave another talk and have worked with uh, launching attacks over Bluetooth too. So you're not, you're not sending data as much as you're just command and control over Bluetooth. So if, if you've done the other scenarios, and this can be done with you know, the previous stuff I'm talking about, if you know that you want to launch an attack in a certain time frame and you're physically around or you go over 
Like uh, you send an SMS text, there are adapters for this sort of thing where you could go over a uh, cellular network. You know, you can click go and it sends the text and then it gets interpreted and then it launches it. But in this case, I'm using Bluetooth, so I'm just creating, you know, hitting a go and it'll launch the tech then. But, but here, I'm just I'm dumping the data. So it'll go to whoever connects to it, it'll just dump all your, your information out uh, pretty easily. This is a very, very simple one. It also involves no soldering. How many people have built their own desktop? Duh. There's more than that. Come on, we're a lot of nerds in here. Yeah, shamed. Um, so most desktops, you probably know, have this very, very common port uh, that's generally two USB ports. And the reason it exists is so you can run a USB line to pretty much anywhere on your case. So the motherboard has USB built in, but sometimes you want USB like in the front of the case. It's a pretty common thing. Um, so these ports exist to, to have that. So all I did uh, was bought the generic USB to 4 adapter, which is something that you find online. It's very easy. Uh, USB to micro USB, and then glitch. And I just plug it in, close it up, walk away. Um, again, this is, a, this is a good one for you have two minutes scenario alone with the system, unscrew the one screw that's holding the case on, pop it open, plug in, close it, walk away. And then you've got your timing and everything set up and it'll launch or, you know, you can resell it with this or whatever. So what does the user see? I talked about a little bit, this is the keystroke injection side. What's the user going to come across and, and see this interaction of like these keystrokes doing weird things? They're not sure what's going on. Um, just plan ahead. Think about, again, the non-stereotyped users I was talking about, uh, what, what works well for them. If you bring up a command prompt and the command prompt just starts typing, downloading new driver, don't touch keyboard for five minutes, the user's going to be like, well, I should get coffee or tea. You know, they're not going to be like, whoa, that's weird. Command prompt. Like, that's, uh, you know, the hardware does funny things. Computers are, uh, you know, difficult. So you just see that pop up. And as long as you have a little friendly message at the beginning, they're going to be like, okay, all right, I'm, I'm out. Yeah, I'll go, go to the bathroom or whatever and come back. And then it does all of its stuff in the command prompt. You have your launching your attack. And then it, you know, exits. And as far as they know, nothing has happened. Their system in the front end hasn't changed unless you change the background or leave websites up. I mean, users don't know this sort of stuff. There's a lot that goes in the background. Shock and awe and that they, they're not observing most of the time. So if they can get on you know, their social media websites and their email, if you do anything else, you're, you, that's okay. As long as they can get those two things, users don't care. Uh, so they launch the attack once. Um, it will not attack after that. So that's, I've mentioned this before, but that's a new thing I'm adding on there. So it doesn't sort of do the updating every single time you boot the computer because they might catch on eventually there. Some things we can do to make it a little bit stealthier. Uh, you can clone, so USB devices have IDs. If you're familiar with a MAC address, same concept, except for it's not unique to each device. Uh, manufacturers have their assigned ones and then they do like a device level one. So it's, a, I think it's, this, it's eight digits, um, eight hex digits, I think it is, or that's, I think that's right. Uh, so essentially what we can do if we're um, doing this from firmware, so I'd have, to ref, uh, I'd have to compile the firmware from source for this one as opposed to the other ones where you just can flash it. Uh, but you can emulate the exact same ID. So what you would do is you plug in your USB device, see what its ID is, go to the code, modify it slightly, and then compile, and then your device, aka the, the glitch or other uh, uh, embedded hardware, appears to the computer to be the exact same hardware. So even the drivers will load the same. Everything looks pretty much the same um, when you plug it in. So even that pop-up that looks weird before, you might see several different devices installing. Now it's like, Dell keyboard, Dell keyboard. I mean, that's really not going to uh, show up as something that will really set off any alarms. Um, and we can make it, yeah, it's planning the attack, making it look normal. Uh, wait a while. So if they probably, uh, one of the things I'm working on now is user detection. So if the mouse isn't moving anymore, you know, the users are going to use the mouse every five minutes. I mean, it's very, it's very odd that you would have a mouse and sit there and not be using it. So if you can detect when the mouse is being used and wait until it's after five minutes, ten minutes, whatever, and then launch your attack, you're almost guaranteed that the, the user is um, not going to be there. Uh, and that's something that I'm, I'm working on now. I haven't 
quite figured out the best route to do that. Uh, if you guys have, if anybody here has any ideas about that, you know, please let me know. I'd love to to chat with you and talk about that some. But I think the user detection side is is key for this sort of scenario. So move on from the USB. Um, and again, these are just some concepts for a few attack vectors. I hope that you take away sort of a broader scope of, of hardware. Uh, we'll talk about a Trojan router. Instead of doing Trojan USB, let's do a Trojan router. So we've got hardware, which before was our mouse, our keyboard, our, our uh, point of sale uh, reader. Uh, but whatever hardware it is, we've got our, our Trojan device, which is like a Trojan router. And then we've got the network that it's plugging into. So the method, and I'll show some, some pictures that'll make it a little bit easier. Conceptually, what we want to do is come between the motherboard and the jack on the back. So we're going to focus on wired connections. Uh, like we did with the, the USB before we cut the lines, we want to like cut the lines, place a ad uh, network adapter on one side, a network adapter on the other. So in this scenario, we have the device it's going to connect to our router. Our router is going to have, uh, be connected to the plug that's actually on the outside of the case. And then we're going to charge it uh, by using USB as a scenario. I have a USB powered uh, uh, hub. And that makes it really easy because five volts. USB ports are on the, practically everything that has an ethernet jack now. Uh, so it's really easy to find those, those five volts that are given to USB inside the case. You can tap onto that to power it. If it's a really big USB hub, you're going to have to find some, or sorry, Ethernet hub uh, or router, you're going to have to find some other way to, to power the device. So getting small USB, good stuff. Uh, here are some scenarios of a TV and a Blu-ray player um, that I plugged them into. Uh, and this is still very much in my beta testing. Uh, it, it, it's, it's the scenario of, I, again, I take everything apart. And I'm like, hmm, the, the USB attack against the, uh, the uh, uh, Blu-ray player doesn't really work. What else could I do? Look, there's so much empty space in there. I have to be able to do something. So that's when I decided I should play around with routers. Um, so I haven't actually broken this because this is my TV and my Blu-ray player, and I don't want to break them. So if anybody wants to give me things to break, I would be most appreciative. But uh, I don't really need all my equipment at home to break. Um, so these are mostly just kind of a, as a um, proof of concept. So the best one is obviously the Blu-ray play, Blu player. Uh, the one to the left is a TV. Um, and so you can see here, on the left side, you see the, the yellow cable coming out. That's the Ethernet jack built in to this router. Uh, this one only had one Ethernet jack, so I have a USB adapter to Ethernet going out to the other side. And then I have two little lines coming out from the USB, and they're just clamping in to the power that's coming from the device itself. Uh, it's the same thing for, for both of these. I'm using the exact same um, idea. This is a good picture on the bottom left of the uh, power tap. And these are all parts you can, you can get at very, the very common parts. These aren't like advanced, very rare things or something. You can order them. Uh, online, uh, pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, so what we'd want to do is uh, sever the connection, solder it somehow uh, to, to the motherboard, uh, and then replace the Ethernet jack or tap into the Ethernet jack. Uh, this particular router was really, or this uh, Blu-ray player was really nice because it actually had exposed uh, little points for soldering onto. So that one, when I get home, I might actually play around with because I'm much less likely to destroy it. Uh, and I might just give up and not care because it's, it's an Ethernet jack and I don't really need it to play Blu-rays. Um, but this one can be put into pretty much anything. Uh, I've talked about this. This will be a lead-in. Um, so, sorry. So modifying hardware on the spot. You know, I did the, all this at home. But you've seen doing the, the point of sale or the uh, desktop scenario, screwdriver, five minutes of access or less, you can plug it in and walk away. It's not like a flash drive sticking out of the back or a new hardware or whatever. Um, you can set things to uh, update like a, an alternate firmware through web interface, um, making it very easy. Things I would never do is like open up the TV in a hotel room and stick something in there and then close it back up. That, that would be something I do not recommend anybody ever do. But if you were doing an actual test, that, th that is not here. I did not do that here. <laughs> or I would never do that ever, but I definitely would never do that here. Um, so the, uh, 
the uh, scenario is, you know, really, I mean, this was theoretically in a hotel room. Um, but if you were in, you know, how many TVs do you see in, in corporate offices and around here? I mean, you have lots of access to these things, and they're in possibly very sensitive areas. And who takes apart TVs to look for them as the, you know, the, the thing that might be attacked? I mean, if you were an attacker, you could just have the nearest TV store just keep, you know, pushing stuff on the, the local Craigslist or wherever to sell and get these in there somehow as soon as they plug it into the network for setup because you always have to plug it in the first time the network. You have your, your back door, you have your window, and even if it's just a five-minute window, you've got your tunnel out. So some examples of things you know, to think about when you're doing uh, hardware uh, embedding is you know, KISS. If you're not familiar with this, it's uh, generally keep it simple, stupid. Um, but in this case, it's keep it small, stupid. So you don't want to be trying to put a laptop inside of a TV. That is not, while you have a lot of features there, that's probably not the best scenario. You're going to run into a lot of issues. So some recommendations. Obviously, I have to say I, I built it, so I'm slightly biased to say that the, the glitch is something that I would recommend using. Um, but other devices, the Pwn plug is another um, pen testing uh, tool that, or hardware device that's out there. It's about this big. It actually looks like a power brick, um, but it's preset with a lot of these attack tools to make things really easy. Uh, you'd have to find sort of more power for it. Uh, any Arduino devices could potentially be used. Some are better than others. Uh, Raspberry Pis, which one of the router scenarios was sort of that I'm tinkering with was using a Raspberry Pi for the router. Um, Mini Poner, which was the other router that I was showing, uh, flashed with some uh, attack tools on it. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff, but you're really you're looking at size and, and capability. Um, so that's, that's kind of the modifying of, of hardware portion, and that's been my primary focus, because obviously, you know, built this device, um, I wanted to see what I could do with that. But the other side is, is firmware, and I think there's a few more talks, and I'm glad to see it here uh, at, at Black Hat Asia, uh, about sort of the hardware level um, debugging and modifying. And I think this is, this is another key scenario of things that are easy to do and the same sort of like, we can ship it out to you, I can replace it, uh, doing the same thing is a little bit more difficult to make this super malicious sometimes, but in other times it, it's not. So if you've never done hardware, let's talk about how you would go about trying to modify hardware. Um, I, I promise you any of you guys can do this if you've, you're a programmer at all, it just takes time. You just have to get used to some of the terminology and you know, the languages and stuff. A lot of this stuff is very accessible. So we want to research, when you pop open the device, probably the biggest chip on there is the one you care about. It almost always works out that way. That's the one you want to go after. Whatever's physically the biggest is actually generally the most important. So you look at a couple of different common chip types, like the ARM, Texas Instrument, whatever. You're looking for things, and these are a little more tricky uh, exposed ports. So those little holes, if you see the board with a lot of little holes in them, if you see some in a row, those are interesting. You should, you know, take a picture of that and post it up somewhere and say, what, have you, what do you guys think this should, is? Or, you know, could somebody tell me what I should try to test this with? Uh, some common ones are JTAG, which again, tomorrow I believe there's, there's a talk on JTAG. Um, serial over UART, some other very common uh, uh, interaction methods. Uh, so you're looking for those, and then you're looking to see, can you, can you debug it? Sometimes debug means, you know, getting the input-output. Sometimes it means you can modify it. There's all kinds of stuff you can do with these debug ports. And the reason they exist is manufacturers, A, want to be able to test when they're developing, and B, if you ship it back to them and it's broken, they don't want to throw it away. They want to, you know, refurbish it. That's the whole, if you heard refurbished devices, that's what they do. They use these debugs and they either flash it with new firmware or try to figure out what's wrong, you know, take some chips off, replace a couple things, and then ship it back out and charge you 75% of what they used to. Uh, so these things are, are easy and they're very common, common standards. Uh, two great tools to use are the Bus Pirate and the GoodFet because they will talk to lots of different types of chips, lots of different architectures. They're both very open source, source very user friendly. Um, some other common ones, FTDDI adapter is essentially a serial adapter. And for, for people maybe um, a little more vintage than me, are very used to uh, the idea of serial. In the you know, 80s, 90s is when USB kind of took over, but prior to the 80s, or the 80s and 
further back. Serial was very common. That's how everything interacted. It's still very common in hardware. We just don't, as users, interact with it nearly as much as we used to. So it still exists because it's very simple to interact with and why rebuild everything. So a lot of stuff and a lot of times debug, dumping information, bio stuff ends up being accessible over firmware or over the serial connection. Uh, we're looking at IDEs. Again, programmers out there or hobbyist programmers. We're all IT people. Nobody wants to raise their hand here. I don't, you guys don't like me. I get it. I get it. It's cool. It's cool. I'm on camera. Nobody sees you raising your hand. That, that gets lost almost instantly. Um, looking for development communities. Awesome. Type in the type of chip. You, what you do is you look, take the board. You look the very, very fine print. So if you have glasses, you might need a magnifying glass. It's very fine print. Generally say the type, the arm, and then you see a bunch of letters and numbers. You type those out onto the internet. You get a response, and you say, oh, that's this kind. And then you look for the development community, and I guarantee it'll be massive. Because as far as like, all the products we buy in the world really revolve around a very small subset of chips. You would be surprised at how many manufacturers if you open up the case, they're, they're exactly the same, except for the case is different. I mean, there's very, very similar, very common hardware that's used throughout, because it's, you know, it's the best of its line, so all the high ends use it, or it's the middle of the line, so all the medium brands use it. So there's massive communities out there, and you know, deadlines and such, people are posting stuff online to get, you know, we've got to get it done, we need to figure out how to get this done. Um, and also, in recent years, with hobbyists wanting to use these chips for their own endeavors, for either startups or just you know for fun, uh, you find a lot of communities out there that develop with this. So you'll find uh, open source libraries, you'll find links, big excerpts of code, um, things like that. So getting started in this, again, the learning curve is maybe not what it used to be even 10 years ago. And then the flashing methods, these are some programmers. The two middle ones, the top one's the good fit. The bottom middle one is the uh, bus pirate. You've got a couple of other very common programmers. I don't think any of these cost more than $40. They're, they're very cheap, very accessible, because manufacturers want to make it, you know, they've got a big group of people where they want startups to try to use their chip. Because I'm a startup, and I've got lots of funding, and I might potentially buy 10,000, 100,000 units Well, my startup is very small. But in the end, if I get funded, it'd be very big. So they try to make it a very low entry level for a lot of these. Uh, jailbreak is obviously everybody's like, when I say that, how many people's minds is like iPhone, Android, like that's where your mind goes right away. Oh, jailbreak. Uh, but you can jailbreak, you know, firmware as well. Um, you essentially jailbreaking is almost putting it into the development mode version where you can interact in lower levels. Uh, you can use maybe default development credentials if they get exposed somehow. Uh, you can connect through a lot of the common adapters that I was talking about. It also doesn't have to be very mysterious. A lot of stuff will update over USB. A lot of your devices, you plug in the USB, you know, if you go to the website to update your firmware drivers or something, or firmware, uh, sorry, your printer drivers or printer firmware, it's, a lot of it takes place over USB or through the, the network. So these are things that aren't as you know, obscure or bizarre to a lot of people, um, and a lot of times that'll work as a method to interact or upload your malicious firmware. A lot of things run Linux, yay! A lot of devices run embedded Linux, older versions of Linux, because newer versions, with their hot sexiness, uh, aren't really like the core of it. Like, there's so many drivers in Linux now that are built in that makes the kernel massive. But all they need is a TCP IP stack and some controllers and some basic commands. So a lot of times you find older versions of the kernel, which you know, could be used for exploits, older versions of tools. Um, but uh, you've also got, you know, it's Linux, so you can compile something else for it, which makes it very easy. Uh, it's GNU, and by uh, the license, it's required to be published. So it's, it's been, is it published? Sure, they published it, you know, on this really, really obscure link, you know, and it has no links to it anywhere on the web, and robots.txt says you can't touch this. That's where they put, you know, my source code. Um, but it's technically you're supposed to publish it. A lot of times you'll find stuff that's, that's half open source and half not, like they'll do, the lower level will be the open source, but they have some closed source versions in there. Uh, so everybody wants BSD, because BSD says do whatever you want, don't tell anybody, we're cool. Uh, you have things, so this Linux, 
is compiled for not the same architecture as we're used to. It could be compiled for ARM, which a lot of phones run, or a lot of the other architectures also will run Linux or people have ported it over. So that's the ideal scenario, because people, I'm sure the significant number of people in the crowd, I'd like to think all hands would be raised, but I won't ask because I don't want to be let down. Um, or have experience with, uh, with Linux and porting over stuff using existing tools, very easy. Um, and these are, you know, can be small and very embedded devices. Uh, so things that run Linux, you can look up um, online that, that they run them. It's a little harder to find sometimes. Printers, every printer you've ever touched ever runs Linux. Uh, TVs, there's some good TVs out there that run Linux. Uh, same thing, DVR, DVD, Blu-ray, Blu-rays. Routers, lots of routers. Um, you can run it on a, the watch. I mean, I'd, like you can run, Linux runs on everything, or the giant Linux geek community will convert it to Linux. Um, but these are like, these are devices that you're not necessarily modifying. They're going to run Linux natively. Uh, and almost anything you can ping, because why re rewrite the TCP IP stack if you can just download Linux and run it? Uh, I'm running low on time, so I'm going to go through this part pretty quickly. Flashing open source firmware onto routers is good. That's what I was talking about before, using those routers. Um, and you can do it with across brands, tons of different routers. Uh, DDWRT and OpenWRT are very commonly found. So not security, hackery stuff. It's just you can get a lot more features with it. Uh, you can you know, configure it. These are some just ones I picked up offline. The one to the uh, far right is actually the one that I was using in the scenario. And then you can see it, you know, these are the ones cracked open. If you want to embed them, obviously you want to remove the plastic case because you have no reason for it. Uh, but also sometimes you have to open them up to modify them. Uh, in this case, you can all, you know, creating this Trojan router, um, the idea that I had that I haven't implemented yet is essentially you, have, you flash it with the open source firmware, but you clone the normal web interface. So again, users have no idea because the if open source firmware is very advanced, whereas normally the home one is not. So you're cloning it, you're mapping everything out, uh, but then your Trojan firmware that you can ship by itself. So this isn't embedded. This is just reselling a router. Could enable a VPN with your credentials. Could create a reverse SSH connection back out to you. Could have the hacking tools that get launched to attack the inside of the network. You know, whatever. Um, so kind of in conclusion, what, what kind of devices can we attack? Uh, I want to say everything. But it's Pretty much everything. I just listed a few things. But it, you know, what has firmware? All devices. It's just how can we use them in an attack scenario? Some really quick countermeasures. Um, you know, purchase from a reputable source. If you're uh, monitoring your network for these sorts of things, if, you're, if your printer is or your, um, your TV is making SSH connections out, you probably want to look into that. That's not normal. Uh, disable debug parts if you're a hardware manufacturer and enforce some sort of update authentication for firmware. Uh, I've got a bunch of resources listed. Um, I'll probably put these online. There's a lot to go through, but this is sort of some stuff. Uh, if you're local here to Singapore, check out Kim Lim Tower. They have a lot of electronics and stuff in there. I was there the other day. It was like a kid in a candy shop. It was awesome. I'd like to thank a lot of people here, but because I'm short on time, this is the end of my presentation. That's my creds. Um, I think it'll cut off on the video. I don't know if I'm done with being up here. But I can try to take a question until they tell me I have to leave. Or not. Yeah. Um, with the rubber ducky, I, um, I, I kind of paralleled their project some, uh, and then they got out way ahead of me. Uh, the idea of the ta attack scenario is pretty much the same. Uh, my focus has been sort of embedding it. So you can port the attacks from the, the ducky, which is another uh, device that can do keystroke injection. Um, you can port the devices between that and, and some other hardware. Uh, I focused on embedding and also having you able to run multiple, uh, multiple attacks and also being able to connect things like a USB or a Bluetooth adapter in. So my pinouts allow you to connect third-party hardware into it. Um, and uh, so I tried to, most of my, my idea was not just to have it be keystroke injection, but to be able to modify it to be lots of different things at once. Um, thanks. Uh, any, any other questions? You're yawning. You threw me off. All right. Uh, this stuff is up here. I'm sure they're switching out for the next talk, but if anyone wants to look at the hardware real quick, I'm going to try to find somewhere to set it out because I'd like people to be able to poke at it and see it. So. 
Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here.